Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. So that song, the lyrics are from 1 Corinthians 13. Anyone have that read at your wedding? Any couples here? You know, a few of us. We did. We did. I'm so grateful that they shared that this morning. So I want to start with a little joke about a little girl who went to her very first wedding. And she was all dressed up and prettiest dress she ever worn she's excited and she's there with her mom and she sees the bride and the bride's in all white and she said so mommy why is the bride wearing all white and her mom says well white is the color of happiness and so she's wearing all white because this is the happiest day of her life and the little girl thinks about that and she goes but mommy why is the groom in all black <laughs> Now, husbands, be careful here. They don't have to give your wife that reason why. <laughs> love. So we're here to talk about, share about love this morning. In the very beginning of the Bible, the first book of Genesis, there are the first four words of the Bible. Anybody know what the first four words of the Bible are in Genesis? In the beginning, God. Right? In the beginning, God. And then in the Gospel of John is where in the Bible it explains what God is. And John says God is what? Love. In the beginning, God. God is love. So if you take the words of John that begin the Gospel of John that say um, God is... Let me, <laughs> let me just make sure I've got this. So... Um, yeah, in the beginning was the word. So if you replace God with love, in that text you could say, in the beginning was love, and love was with God, and love was God, and love was God. And when God created humankind, Genesis tells us in this allegory about how we were created, God said, let us create humankind in our image and after our likeness. In our image and after our likeness. So we're all created in that image and likeness of love. This is our very origin. It's the root of our being. No matter what kind of personality you created or the people in your life you created, that the root of our being, our origin, is always love. No matter how much we stray from that in our thoughts and our actions or we see others do that, we can always remember that. So today I invite you to remember that you were created in love. That is how you were created, and that was how you were envisioned to express in your life. So in your living the fullness of who you are, you're living love. Speaking about fullness, there are so many words that we have in our English vocabulary that indicate fullness of an experience, like joyful, peaceful, insightful. Why don't we have the word loveful? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great word to show that you are full of love? Are you willing to be loveful today? Yeah. Loveful? Say, I'm loveful. I am loveful. I am loveful. I am full of love. Yes. Yes. Why not be loveful? And especially with Valentine's Day coming up to remind us the holiday of cards and chocolates and roses and candlelight dinners, right? That's all wonderful stuff that we buy and do for each other, and they're all symbols of love, but we know that things are not love, right? Because your life could be full of things, all things that you like. We may know people who have the house, the car, the job, the relationship, and be living out of touch with love be living a life where they're not feeling love. They're not feeling love because love is more than things. Love is that tender-hearted care that we give to each other. 
Though, if you were on the Five Love Languages retreat yesterday, I know we had some couples who went uh, yesterday with Cindy and Ed for a wonderful retreat. One of the love languages is giving gifts, right? And that is a way to show your love to somebody whose gift is love. And there are other, other gifts, of course, but recognizing that those are symbols, right? Those are languages to show the tender, loving care, which is the heart of what love is. Remember Charlie Brown and the Valentine's Day special? He goes to his mailbox and he doesn't get any Valentine's. He keeps looking in his mailbox. He doesn't get any Valentine's cards. And how does he feel? He's like so defeated. He's just always defeated, right? We love Charlie Brown. He's just, oh, he's the underdog. And we're always, find him so, um, you know, pathetic sometimes. <laughs> um, but Charlie Brown was, he was, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> he was looking for love outside of himself, right? And how often do we do that? We think love is a commodity to be received. That love is something we have to get outside from the world. And that if we're not getting it from other people, then we don't have it and we feel empty. We can live like that. There are some people who live their whole lives like that, trying to get love from the world, wondering why they don't feel love, why they're not receiving love, feeling depressed and lonely, and they've lost touch with that love is an inner experience. It arises from the ground of your being, from the truth of who you are, that we only ever feel love by being loving. We think we feel love, that other people love us, but we're feeling the love that we have for them. I experienced that most fully when we had our child, Felicity, holding her as an infant. And she wasn't trying to love us. She wasn't trying to do anything to be loving. She was just pure presence and love, right? But my heart, it was so full. It's like, oh, it was so, so full. And I recognized that, that is my love for her. She's not doing anything, right, to make that happen. That's my love. I felt that also in a similar way when we got our puppy. <laughs> a little baby beagle, he was seven, like almost eight weeks old. He was so tiny. He was like, oh, oh you know. <laughs> that life, that precious young life. That precious life. And as we get older, we can forget how precious life is. We forget that everybody started little and tiny and cute and just glowing. And we return to that awareness. Return to that awareness of love. The whole idea of finding somebody, I, you hear some married couples say, oh, this is my better half, or he completes me. That indicate something's missing, like you're not complete without the other person. In my 20s, I remember before I, I met my husband that I had this whole idea of soulmate, that there was going to be this person who was like thinking my thoughts and answering my sentence, like, like completing my sentences, and we, we were just glued at the hip, and like we were like one person. Why did I want that? Like now I see it like, <laughs> in my 40s, I'm like, why did I want that? Why did I think that that was the thing? But that, uh, that was my vision. That was my romanticized vision of these two intertwined, you know, beings of uh, soulmate. I had this idea of it, and... Um, and I'm really grateful that I met my husband 20, 20 years ago. We've been together 20 years, which is just amazing how time has flown. I love him so much. I was like, what, what, how, how do I even start talking about my marriage and, and our love together? That, um, that I did not marry somebody who was exactly like me. Thank God that we have differences and we have different interests and opinions. And uh, I found out things about him the longer we were together. Like, he likes horror movies. He loves them. I didn't like, oh, not my thing. He got into fantasy football for a few years. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, that was his thing, right? I, I'm a tap dancer. I like uh, Jimmy Buffett. But he, I got him into the Jimmy Buffett as we... <laughs> <laughs> he finally got it, what that was all about, right? 
But that's, that, I feel, is the beauty of being in relationship with somebody, that you each bring something to the table and you're not trying to be each other. Like, the world doesn't need another G. Marie. The world needs a David. You know, we need our unique expression and not to lose ourselves in trying to be like the other person. That that's not love. That was a misunderstanding that I had. So we're kind of, I think of us like peas and carrots. You know, they taste great together, but you can have them separately, and they're great. You know, he has his life, I have my life, and I'm grateful for all the support that, um, that I have from him and that I always do support him and all that he does. Very grateful. So love is learning to love the person, whoever it is, if it's your partner or other people in your life, loving that person as who they are right now rather than some imagined fantasy version of who you think that they could be, should be, more like you, that kind of thing, or whatever it is, that that's not love. That's actually um, not loving to be that way, to try to make somebody something that they're not. But what we can do to be really loving is to support somebody in their growth. If there's somebody you love in your life that has an addiction, to support them in recovery and their growth there. To support each other in the ways that we're personally growing and changing. That's loving, but not to, um, to criticize and to treat somebody like they should not be who they are. And think about it how that can unconsciously be running within you. The desire for people or a person in your life, family member, to be something that they're not or maybe not even capable of being. So that's the advanced work in love, is loving people right where they are, as they are, right? So that you can have inner peace. So that you can be a presence of love. Because when we get out of love, that's the ego, right? The ego is the judging mind. So you'll know that. When you're in judgment of somebody, that's the ego mind showing up. So the ego always wants to compare and judge and what's not right and that kind of thing. We do that to ourselves as well. I want to share with you a story of an uh, amazing African-American leader that I found out about as I was preparing for this talk, and I'm really glad that I got to know more about him. His name is Bayard Rustin. Have you heard of him? Yeah. yeah. He is a civil rights leader. He's also a gay rights leader. Uh, he worked for nonviolence. And this is a story about how he showed up fully grounded in love in a very difficult situation that he found himself in. And the story goes that he was in a hotel elevator in Spokane, and there was a white man in the elevator with him. And the white man ordered him to tie his shoelace. And Bayard, he did as he was told, and he, he tied the man's shoelace. And the man went to give him a tip, and Bayard said, oh, I, I didn't do it for the money. I, thought it be, I did it because I thought you needed help. And the man was so embarrassed. He realized what he had done, that he was treating him with discrimination and how unloving that was. And he apologized. And he invited Bayard to come to his hotel room to talk about human rights issues. And they, they had a discussion around that. Uh, and, and he, you know, he was, he apologized to him. Now, Bayard could have blown up in that situation. I think we would have said he had every right to, to say, this is wrong, you're discriminating against me, this is not respectful of me. But the way that he showed up in that moment showed his own deep self-respect and the self-love that gave him the inner strength to stay in love, to not take this personally. He didn't treat this man with, uh, as being, offense, being an offense to him because he didn't feel a threat to his own security. That's advanced love right there, to not respond in anger because there are so many opportunities to do so. Just turn on the news, right? <laughs> to get angry and caught up in what's going on in the world and let that take your centeredness and security away by getting hooked, hooked, those hooks are out there, right? 
but to choose to remain centered in love like Bayard did. And then a conversation opens, and there's some understanding. And this man, I didn't say in the story his name, which is probably better, we don't know, but that he was changed by that experience. So Bayard responding in love allowed that man that he connected with to experience a healing and a shift and his eye is opening. That's a miracle moment, right? That's a holy instant that happened there. And we can create that when we show up as the love that we are and, and not just uh, kind of falling with the impulse of the ego and the judging mind. So how do we get past those experiences of anger, of judgment, to really treat people with love? So that's that shift from thinking of love, right? I, I, I know what love is. It's candles and valentines and flowers and roses or, you know, chocolates, whatever that is, to being loving, right? To actually being a presence of love. And so to do that, we need to see people with new eyes. And it's a practice, and we can all do it. We all have the ability to do it, to see past what appears to be fake or personality, whatever we think might be irritable about the person, to see through that and to see the love that they are created as, the love that they are. We can all do this. We can do this with the most difficult people in the world and, and in our lives, and it's a practice. And it will transform you just to do that, to look beyond appearances, to see through that which is unlike love rather than at the person, to see through to the love and salute the divinity and the love that they are. The love that Jesus was teaching is this inner-centered love, not the love that's get, get from the world, I need to get love from the world in order to be filled. It's inner-centered, it's coming from an endless resource of love. That's the love that we call unconditional love, agape love that we're talking about. It's not just loving people who are lovable, right? Like, I love my dog, I love my family, they, you know, they treat me nice, and we, that kind of thing. Yeah, those are easy to love. Jesus is calling us to love the unlovable, who, who seem unlovable to us, not to God. They are loved in the eyes of God, right? So a love that says, I loved him with all of my heart, until he cheated on me, or until he did that, and now I hate him forever. That was never true love. That was never true love. Conditional love, right? Love that is not depending on the other person to make you happy. Whoa. <laughs> that you can find that within yourself. Buy yourself the flowers and the chocolate. <laughs> you know? Take good care and love of yourself so that you can be loving and a loving presence and not be like, oh, in that victim consciousness we can get. We think everybody should be able to read our mind and do what we want them to do. That love is where it starts with taking the best care of yourself, loving yourself up so that you can be a vehicle and a presence and the essence of love in the world. One of the re readings we had at our wedding is one from Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare, I love the sonnets, and it's from Sonnet 116, and part of it goes like this. Love is not love which alters when an alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. An ever-fixed mark. So that means that your love for your partner, for your family, for the people in your life, that that love is not shaken by them dropping your favorite dish and <laughs> it was a family heirloom and now that can never be replaced, it can never be forgiven, right? That is never shaken, no matter what happens. That's the love that we're talking about here. We're talking about love. And 1 Corinthians 13, which Siobhan sang the words from that, it just so beautifully expresses love. But first I want to share something from 1 Corinthians 10 that the Apostle Paul shares. So the Apostle Paul was working with this group, the Corinthians, who were in Greece, who were first century Christians, followers of the way, and they were fighting. You know what they were fighting about? Who had the better spiritual gift? Well, I could speak in tongues. 
I can give prophecy. I can read oracles. Like, who's better? Paul, tell us who's better, because you know, we all have something special to bring, and we want to know who's the best. Who's, what's more important here? And Paul's like, okay, you got a little off point here with the spiritual gifts. Yes, they're important. They're meant to be vehicles of love. So if you don't bring love, when you share your gift, whatever your gift is, it's not, it's not worth anything. And so but in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. And I think that's really useful in relationships to recognize when your relationship is about my needs, my needs, my needs, my needs, right? When you seek for the other person to succeed, to have the best life they can, to be happy, and that person is seeking that for you and is praying with you and seeking the best for you, that's what love is. That's where it's mutual. That's loving, right? That's loving. Not always being competitive, trying to get your way, but being each other's support system. So the three main definitions of love in 1 Corinthians that I want to talk about is love is patient, love is kind, and love is humble. So I love what you said, Kat, about don't, don't pray for patience. <laughs> so, um, so it's not that... Uh, Praying for patience in this case, it's that allowing things to take the time that they take. So uh, as you're growing together, that things are unfolding in the timing, that they're unfolding without that kind of pressure like this needs to happen now and this, this, and just allowing a natural unfolding. For me, patience is being a good listener because I recognize that in my job, I have do a lot of listening. And so sometimes when I'm with my husband, I recognize that I'm like, okay, maybe I'm a little tapped out on the listening. And <laughs> I can be a little short with him. And uh, as far as, you no know, listening, and, I'm, and I'm work, I keep working on being better about that and giving him my full attention and presence, putting aside my stuff and being fully present to him. And it's a practice, and I recognize that. He's, he's been, he's, his patience is amazing. I feel like these essen, essences of love, patience, kindness, humility, that, that we can really see them in others, right? We see them in others well. And uh, when I had my C-section and David was, like, he had to take care of me because I, I couldn't, like, really lift things and I was taking care of my daughter. There's a lot of patience involved there. And I'm very grateful for that. And we can honor and recognize that kind of care, that tender care that takes time without allowing things to fluster you and anger you, right? So love is kind. Love is kind uh, even in the worst situations, right, that you, that you see the innocence in the other person, right? Um, even something as small as making, uh, ordering food when you're too tired to make a meal, that kindness. Humility, humility. Um, admitting that you need help, that you need your partner's help. You not, can't do it all. Humility, and I think of like my, my husband and moving here to Houston and leaving his job and his whole life in New York that he had, was an associate producer of Broadway shows and that he let that go to support the call of spirit to come here that that's that humility where you follow that call of spirit and support each other in being where you're called to be. So I want to share with you that before we move into the vow renewal, uh, just a bit of this 1 Corinthians 13 here in the scholars version, which is the version that scholars are saying is the closest, uh, modern scholars, the closest to a modern translation of the Greek that Paul wrote in. If I were fluent in human and heavenly tongues, but lacked love, I'd sound like a hollow gong or a crashing cymbal. Bong. Not musical, right? Not like the beautiful gong wash that we have from our wonderful Mary Fair who does that for us sometimes. Just clangy, noisy. 
If I could interpret oracles and had the key to all sacred rites and secrets and every insight, if I had all the confidence in the world to move mountains but lack love, I'd be nothing. If I parted with all that I owned and offered my body to the sacrificial flames but lacked love, it would do me no good. Love takes time, makes itself good and useful. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it doesn't bluster, it doesn't make a scene, it doesn't look after its own interests, it doesn't throw fits, it doesn't dwell on the negative, it takes no pleasure in injustice, but is delighted by the truth. Love never falls away, though oracles will cease, tongues will fall silent, insight will fall short. We know bits and pieces. In bits and pieces we deliver oracles, but when the whole picture emerges, the bits and pieces will disappear. We see bits and pieces, not the whole picture. And we will see the whole picture. When I was very young, I talked like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I grew up, I put an end to childish ways so that I can make space for mature love. Now we look at a reflection quite obscure. Then we'll gaze face to face. Now I know only bits and pieces, then I shall know as I am known. So then confidence, hope, and love, these three endure, but the greatest of these is love. So now I want to invite us into a time of expressing the love that we have uh, for those who are committed couples. If you would like to participate in the vow renewal, will you please stand where you are? Well, what do you think, Karen? Do we have enough room on stage for everybody? Well, those who would like to participate and be on stage, you're welcome to. If you'd like to come up and participate on stage, if you'd like to stay where you are, you're welcome to stay where you are. <laughs> okay. We are gathered here for the purpose of renewing a commitment of love. Scripture tells us that love is the nature of God. When we are in love, we are in God. We are here to reveal the truth of spiritual reality in our relationships with one another. Nowhere is this more true than in marriage. Your relationship allows you to grow and build upon the lives you have created individually. You have chosen to be together in a marriage where you are safe to express your feelings emotions, and thoughts. Marriage is a great adventure when it is an outward expression of a great love. Love is our truest nature and expresses through us from an infinite source. In marriage, we are our most intimate and authentic selves, and it is there that the love we are is the most palpable. Love requires honesty, honesty within yourself and also with your spouse. Be honest and open with each other and ask for what you need. Take action even though you may be afraid. Share how you feel, listen with your heart, and give your partner freedom and support to be the unique gift of God that he is, that she is. Marriage is the form in which you have chosen to express and to live your love relationship. To serve its purpose, your marriage will grow as you grow, but your unchanging commitment to life and to love will allow you both to experience a magnificence unknown to you before. So will you now face each other and join hands? David, if you'd like to come up. I don't know how I'm gonna do this with David while I'm leading it, but we're gonna try. <laughs> and repeat, decide who's going to go first in your couple, decide who's gonna go first, and then whoever's going first will repeat after me. You can go first. Sure. I, and say your name. I, David. Take you, say your partner's name. Take you, Jean Marie. As my partner in life. As my partner in life. To share my life openly with you. To share my life openly with you. 
to love and encourage you, to love and encourage you, to honor and tenderly care for you, to honor and tenderly care for you, to speak the truth to you in love, to speak the truth to you in love, through all the changes of our lives, through all the changes of our lives. This day I renew my vow to you. This day I renew my vow to you. With an even greater commitment. With an even greater commitment. I am here for you. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And now switch. And repeat after me. I say your name. I, Jean Marie. Take you and say your partner's name. Take you, Damon. As my partner in life. To share my life openly with you. To love and encourage you to honor and tenderly care for you, to speak the truth to you in love through all the changes of our lives. This day, I renew my vow to you with an even greater commitment. I am here for you yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So in a, it is traditional in a wedding to exchange the gift of rings. It is most fitting on this day of recommitment and renewal to exchange a gift as well. Right now, turn to your partner and gaze into this face that you love. Remembering the months and years of your love, think of something you are grateful for that this beautiful soul brings to your life, to your home, and to your marriage. Just one thing, I know there are many, but let just one gift you've been given here rise in your awareness now. It may be a quality that he or she possesses, such as loyalty or honesty. It may be an act of service, a specific one, or a pattern of love and care that he or she has exhibited to you. Think of this gift that your partner has so freely and lovingly given to you in this relationship as you silently thank them now as you look into their eyes. Now, each in turn, tell your partner what gift they have brought you that you are so grateful for. <laughs> we can share it later. <laughs> oh, not yet, not yet. I'll, I'll wait. We'll get there. We're gonna get there. I promise. I know there's a lot of love flowing here already. I can feel it. So now, feeling both the gratitude for your partner that you have expressed, and also how good it feels to be appreciated by your spouse, I ask you this. What gift will you give today and into the future in your relationship? Perhaps it is just to do or be more of what your partner has thanked you for. Maybe there's something else that you know he or she will love. Let your heart open. Be generous. What would she love to receive from you? What would he love to receive? Don't worry about being eloquent. Saying it simply is the best way. Tell your partner what you want to give them going forward from this moment, each in turn. The vows that you have spoken, the promises you have made and renewed here today must be re-decided, re-promised, and renewed tomorrow and every tomorrow that comes. For the marriage is not an event. It is a process, an activity of living and the activity of love. It is liberating. It sets each of you free to become your very best self, knowing that you have the wind of spirit at your back and the hand of your beloved in your own. It makes burdens lighter because you divide them. It makes joys more intense because you share them. 
It makes you stronger so that you can reach out and become involved in life in ways you dared not risk alone. And so may your days be long upon this earth. May you dwell in love and peace and good health together. And may each of us find joy in the joy that you continue to find in each other. Amen. So in as much as you have agreed here in the eyes of God and in the eyes of this church, to dedicate yourselves to each other in loving commitment. It is my deep and sacred honor to pronounce you partners in life and in love. You may now kiss your beloved. <laughs> <laughs>